Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Jess. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Await Further Instructions, which came out in 2018, written by Gavin Williams and directed by Johnny Kevorkian. Gary, give us a synopsis to this film. Well, the story follows Nick, played by Sam Gattins, who travels to his family home for Christmas with his new girlfriend Angie. The awkward family gathering soon takes a turn for the strange when they find themselves trapped inside while receiving a mysterious transmission through the television. Await further instructions. Well, this is nonsense. Nonsense. Am I the only one here with any sense whatsoever? Well, um, well, it's, straight it's off a the Netflix. Back. It's a Netflix film. We probably should be. I think it was also on Shudder. This was a, a, a very low budget indie British sci-fi mystery horror film. Yeah, the director's only done like one film before it, and unfortunately, he passed away last year. So this is his final piece of his kind of two film of uh, filmmaking. The Disappeared was his first film. True. Yeah. Um, this film came out with very little fanfare. No, and it is incredibly... It's indie. It's indie, and it came out on some form... You know, it's a small, but low-budget film that's with a small cast, set in a small set. And that's fine. Um, <laughs> it is exactly... You get kind of exactly what you pay for here. I mean, not to be cruel to the now deceased director and such, but it is a film that is... A little bit run of the mill, and I mean, some people speak of it a bit more marmitey, which is a British what? reference. If you don't know what marmitey means, it's um chalk and cheese. And some people love it, some people hate it. Absolutely, I'm, the I'm, reviews for it are very, uh, very polar opposite. I'm not a, an emotional about this film personally, so uh, I may disagree with that. And, and you know, the the reviewer split. I'm more in the middle, which is like, eh. um, the cast wise, they are mostly unknowns, bar one. Um, the grandfather is played by David Bradley of innumerable film fame, which uh, we love him as a cr- you know, from Harry Potter to. Uh... Uh, he was he was fantastic in Game of Thrones, and he yes. was also absolutely brilliant in the Strain TV series. I know him mostly from television, but every role he takes, he makes it his own, and yeah. he is fantastic. He's been playing a crotchety old man for most of his life, by the way. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but in this one again, he plays a crotchety old man. Now. The rest of the cast are serviceable. I think there's a, there's a few long term actors like um, you have essentially the we'll go through the cast and we have Sam Gittins uh, who plays Nick. Uh, we have Nija Narik who plays Angie, and they're essentially the first two we're introduced to as they arrive at Nick's family home to to which spend we find Christmas. out he hasn't been back there in many many years. And that's because it's a bit of a dysfunctional family. He's almost the outcast of this family. He doesn't really like the hierarchy of the uh, of his dad and, of course, his his granddad. Uh, there's a very toxic relationship there, and the fact that he's he's bringing home this girlfriend, which he knows the family are not going to gel with, mm. uh, as we soon find out that they're very racist and uh, and they're they're they're, they're pretty vile. Uh, people, but then again, most of the characters in this film are not really likable. But at mm. least they are. They they may be stereotypical. They may be one dimensional, but they do serve a purpose in terms of being able to easily identify who these characters are before the strange events start to occur. Again, that's one of my criticisms. It is a bland film in the bland characters doing bland things. But again, it's to service a script from A to B, and it makes a very it's a, the lack of nuance in these people, and you know the the sister again. We'll keep moving. Is Holly Weston plays Kate's sister, who's pregnant, um, and she's just a bit of a. Somehow it feels weird. They're, he's a bit. She's a bit more common feeling than he is. Like he's just a little bit smarter or better educated. And again, that's a disconnect within a family, which is strange, and it feels a bit jarring. Like they're just shoving stereotypes into a family just to serve the purpose. You've got the meek and mild mother. Um, Abigail, you got the mother played by Abigail Crittington, who's the only other actor I noticed that played anything interesting. She, she appeared in the Sharp TV show of, as Sharp's wife, um, uh, which is a notable role because they, they had quite a lot of series of that. But the broad point is um, she's the only other notable actor in this that has seemingly had quite big roles in terms of a TV show that was quite successful for its time. Um, she's, she's again a bit of a stereotypical meek and mild mother and a fairly, pay, you know, Iron Fist ruled house between the, you know, the grandfather and the father both being 
quite authoritarian and again i think there's on the nose metaphors being used here and it just feels a bit clumsy at times um you need to give some empathy to characters for us to care when they die which i think is half the problem with this i and they, they, i'll get to the very end where they knock off the character you meant maybe you have the most empathy with off screen almost and i'm like what the bloody point was half of this film like, it's just like <laughs> i give up um but yeah so essentially you're introduced that's the mum the dad the sister oh her boyfriend nearly forgot a boyfriend um chris Sedler plays scott who is the boyfriend and he plays a kind of macho meat heady kind of guy he's sort yeah, of yeah he looks i mean he he gets told at one point to act like a man or be a man but he's one of those yeah. people that also likes to follow orders. He needs somebody to give him direction. He can't really think for yeah, he's himself. A bit, he's, again, he's the, he's a bit dumb. And he's, as we're dating, obviously, the sister who's a bit dumb. He's pregnant. And it's all, it's confusing in that kind of dumbness. It's a, it's like, oh, great. These are just uninteresting characters. And that's the problem. I don't find either of them. He, he is an evil and that is something. He just he does what needs to be done when it needs to be done. Well, that's the thing. None of the characters in this are inherently evil. They just have incredibly, you know, uh, political opinions, which which come to the forefront when they're watching the news. The news reports are reporting on possible terrorist attacks, yeah. which causes the racial arguments to come up, which causes the family tension. You know, right before they sit down to have Christmas dinner. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of one of my uh, favourite, I guess, scenes in the film is when they are all sat around the table and, and the father's like, I'm going to say grace. And you get to see everybody's reactions, like the mother and the daughter. They're like, OK, like dad wants to do grace. We will abide. You know, Nick and Angie are just like, like, we don't really care for grace. Um, you see uh, Scott. He's also just like, OK, I guess the family do grace. So I'm going to play along. Like, he was ready to start serving his dinner immediately. And then you've got the granddad who's like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> because... I was like, that just tells you where all these people are immediately. Yeah, it is. It's a good setup. And that's unfortunate. I don't feel like, again, it pays off hugely. But again, it's, it's one of the better moments. I think the issue is shooting a lot of this is the camera... Sh- cinematography isn't amazing and again when you're working on a small budget in tight situations and what will na- soon turn into a claustrophobic story it doesn't really work because they don't make you feel claustrophobic often the camera shots aren't tight the you know there's a few corridor shots that feel a little close up but again they're not really shot like the close up it feels like the people making this were trained in standard tv dramas you got your wrap round her pinky. Your cunt struck good and proper. Oh, <laughs> that, that is fucking bang out of autographs. Apologise now. Yeah. <laughs> After some of the uh, the arguments in the family, you know, they uh, Nick and Angie end up going up into the bedroom. They're like separated themselves from the family because of the, the the arguments that they were having, and they decide they're going to leave early the next morning to get away. Like they're just going to go home and Angie have a didn't quiet believe Christmas. He, him when she went there, he was like, "No, no, no, you really don't, you want don't. To meet my family." Exactly, exactly. And you know, he has that really nice moment with his mum. You know, where the mum's just like, oh, please, please don't go. And he's just like, look, mum, it's not you. It's not you. It's the rest of them. You know, and I've seen this in family dynamics myself. It's a very real thing. And especially on Christmas, like, it happens. So I thought it was kind of believable. But it is the next morning when when they wake up and go to leave the house that they realise that there is this rubbery, or well, it looks rubbery, but it's this metal sheet that's blocking the front door. Then, then it's the panic mode sets in where they open up all the windows. They go and check all the windows and they can't get out at all. They even try taking an axe to the door and the mother's like, oh, you'll wake the neighbours. <laughs> yeah, she's so, she's so, again, it plays into the gentle mother yeah. trope who's keeping out. Oh, it's just, it, it, it's funny, but it's also, this is kind of like bordering on a black comedy, but I don't feel it's funny enough. Oh, I definitely don't see the black comedy no, at all, I, no. I, I've seen some people mention it, and they were talking about this film as if it were a black comedy. I'm like, no, it's a fairly straight cut. I mean, yeah, and yeah. That, and that's the problem, and that is a problem, because I think if it was slightly more farce, or just slightly more wacky, I think it would have been a better film. Because you could have dealt with the parody with a slight more tongue-in-cheek to it. And again, if you're going to do... There's a lot of on-the-nose politics in this Oh, film. absolutely. And, and I think that's, again, one of the issues. It's too on-the-nose subtlety weaving subtlety into kind of the script would have really helped like the mum i think the nuance of her like they don't really deal with like if she's abused properly i mean she it might be insinuated and again there's no if you're gonna go darker exploration of kind of 
the abusive husband or even abusive grandfather where these two men are clearly... I don't think the father was abusive, but I think he's inherited some of those authoritarian traits from his father who we find out would beat his child. And was military. He was and military was military trained. trained. Yeah, yeah. So it... Um, but you can see that the father is, is, you know, he's not as hard or grizzled as his dad, uh, but still follows, you know, he still... Because of his upbringing, he now respects and follows any authoritarian figure and would follow those instructions without fail which is why then when the television set blinks on and tells the family that they are basically in a lockdown and that they now need to await further instructions like so the father's like okay well we are locked in we must be we're probably being quarantined it's probably a government operation there's probably you know something out there it could be nuclear fallout it could be a virus we don't know what it is so we will just follow instructions because that's what the tv's telling us to do you know and that's when when they're having the christmas dinner and the tv's like just before they're about to carve the turkey after another family argument the tv's like nope your food's contaminated throw it all out and the father's like well you heard the television and he grabs the turkey and all the food and he black bags it up he's going through the cupboards taking all the tin stuff all the packeted stuff out and, and nick's just like whoa, whoa 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 wait a minute like they said the turkey's contaminated but all this stuff is is sealed like surely that's not contaminated and the father's like not taking any chances throwing it all out I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure they can't get outside, so I'm pretty sure they're probably just putting it in a black bag out somewhere that's still accessible anyway. Uh, but then the TV's just like, okay, you followed instructions, but now, the, the, you know, the, he, here's some here's some uh, here's some needles. These have the vaccine in it. Everybody inject yourselves. The father's like, okay, well, I'm gonna follow these instructions blindly. Clearly, we need to take the, this this vaccine. And uh, and Angie, as we find out, is actually a trained nurse. And she explains, like, no, wait a minute. Th these hypodermic needles have been used before and they've not been sterilized. And the dad's like, instruction said, use them. Bump. Injects himself straight away. And then he's, like, forcing the rest of the family to take these injections when they're all very hesitant. And uh, I guess because Angie says they're not sterilized, they decide to boil the hypodermic needles in water, which will not sterilize the needles you need to you need some alcohol uh which i'm guessing angie as a nurse should have known that yeah it was weird it was all very weird everything was weird i mean again it's not if they've been used what's in them could be contaminated there was just so many dumb things of that whole thing immediately then that makes you think like is the government whoever's doing this is it is it is it run out of resources is it like using what it can in order to to vaccine this family right because at this moment in time we don't know Who's delivering these messages? We don't know. Um, now, we do find out that the, the family name is Mildred. And uh, this harkens back to the 1960s, the Mildred experiment, which, which experimented on basically psychological uh, obedience, uh, power and authority, where they basically forced somebody to give another participant electric shocks whenever they got the answer wrong. And the experiment was basically on the person giving the shocks as to whether they would blindly follow an authority figure telling them what to do. We also in the film find out that they're living on Stanford Street, which again harkens back to another psychological experiment that was conducted in a prison. There was also a film released, I think 2015, highlighting it, uh, which basically had some people, some to play as guards and some to play as prisoners, and the scientists basically just watched the psychological warfare ensue where those playing the guards went on a power trip because they were allowed to beat these people playing playing inmates. And so I was like, okay, so the film is definitely drawing from, you know, those real experiments in our history. And, uh, and so now we're seeing these characters now blindly following this authority figure, which is their television set. Yeah, well... They are. That's the problem. I think you kind of get some infighting, but it's very weird that the kind of conflicts don't really come to a head. The characters don't really stand out. I mean, the problem is whether or not this is based in any form of fact. There's a difference between making a factual documentary and making an interesting film. And I don't think the character interactions hold up because they're not, as you say, there's inconsistencies in their actions, and the whole injection thing was so strange 
that I think people should have been acting even the even the dad there should have been some push to make him be this strangely authoritarian because most sensible people would just not play long um well it's the fact that he is he is the hierarchy he is the head of the family and he has the voice which you know it which which dominates he silences the the room many many times i know but it's and not so... believable i don't know something's weird about that whole sequence i just again it's part of the reason this film doesn't gel with me maybe it's just i just don't feel the justification for that is there visibly on screen whether or not you can intone it through your own extrapolations outside of what you're shown in the film is besides the point. It's more that I just don't feel the dad holds the screen. I mean, I'm not criticizing the actor as much as the script. It's, I don't feel, there's something missing. It's just the whole interaction between the family. But then in the end, they do all get injected. And... They do. It's the, uh, the granddad, though, is the one who immediately has uh, a reaction to it. And he starts uh, Jacob's laddering in his chair. And then he kills over and dies. You know, and that's when the family are like, well, we wasn't expecting that to happen. Uh, but they immediately come to the conclusion that, uh, well, possibly they didn't give him the injection quick enough. Or perhaps he had a, an allergic reaction to whatever he was injected with, because they don't know what they got injected with. We don't know whether one of those one of those needles was actually spiked to kill a random member of the family. Yeah, like at the moment, the TV set, the the one giving the instructions, hasn't really given us cause for alarm, other than the fact that the panic is setting in, that they are trapped in this house. There is no way out. There's no no other television signal. There's no internet, and there's no mobile phone service. So they've only got this this TV that's giving instructions is the only link to the to anything that's going on. And so I understand the family starting to panic and break down here. Now, a lot of people have said that a lot of the characters don't act in a believable way. Um, but, like, the human psychology is a crazy thing, you know? And, and certain people do behave strangely to, to these sorts of events. Uh, sure, sure. But not Especially everybody. now when the TV <laughs> then says, one of your party is, is infected, isolate them. You know, and that is when the dad starts to really lose it. And he's like, well, it's got to be Angie. She came into the house with a cold and a sniffle. She's got to be infected. So we need to isolate her. And uh, they end up wrestling and they end up forcing her up into the bedroom upstairs where they're storing granddad. Yeah, I mean, and that's again odd. I mean, it's it's fine. Again, it's working on the kind of conflict in the family, the pr the pressures and such. Um and yeah, again, it's it's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 not totally overreacting, but again, I just feel like I don't know if the premise of following a TV without some sort of slight coercion early on makes as much sense. And that's where I get the issue. I mean, it's just like, all right, the TV may have just killed one of us, so we're just going to trust it that one of us is infected. It's just like. Uh... So the tensions in the family do start to, to build up more when uh, Nick and Scott start to have an argument and uh, they end up wrestling and they, uh, he chases, Scott chases Nick up the stairs and the sister follow, follows up behind them and she gets kind of knocked over in the tumble and she falls off the banister and crashes uh, to the floor breaking her leg kind it, of brutal <laughs> it, it's incredibly brutal because we we know she's pregnant you know we we worry about her and, and her child um but we find out like with the infection in her leg that that nick recalls back to angie in in her isolation that it's infected and if she doesn't get medical treatment soon she will actually die um and so you know this spurs nick on to continue to look around the house to try and find a way out he ends up breaking through behind the bathroom toilet uh, and, and ties his camera to a crowbar, and he captures footage of something moving, something black and snake-like moving up the side of the house. And that is our real first indication that, yes, something otherworldly is occurring outside. Yeah, yeah, and it all, it all starts to unravel from here on out. I mean, um, he's caught. Well, yeah, he, tr he tries to convince his dad oh, no, to, TV, to watch the, the footage, TV. but the TV then tells them that one of their one of their party is now a sleeper agent, and you need to interrogate them. And so, dad, at this point, as you know, he's already gone off, off, you know, off. He's already come off his hinges. Like when when the sister fell down the banister, the boyfriend Scott went into complete shock. The dad went into his office and started looking up, you know, like siege tactics. You know, it's just like they com they had a complete mental breakdown. But now he's just following instructions, like, verbatim off the TV. Because 
nothing is working, nothing is making sense. If at least he follows these instructions, he's got something to do. And yeah. so he starts he starts torturing his son. <laughs> he's begging him to watch the footage and b- believe him that there's something strange afoot in the uh you know, the world at large. He's hacking him up with a box cutter, you know? Yeah, that was kind of... Again, and again, it's it's not overly gruesome, but it is, no. it is fairly shocking, because it is it is a strange family Christmas. Um, well, we also have uh, one of our other, uh, like, most gruesome deaths in the movie, is when uh, the uh, when Angie's in her room, and she starts peeling back some of the, the metal that's inside there, and uh, we get a POV shot and realise that each one of those metal sort of tentacles um, has a has a has a camera feed on them. So it means that the TV seems to have been responding and reacting to the family's actions. And we find out that each one of these cables basically must have uh, speakers or, or a microphone and a camera built into it so it can watch and monitor them. She also then takes apart the television set that's in her room, which told her it can see her, and she finds this organic pulsating creature inside it. Yes, the TVs are alive and yes. they're watching and learning <laughs> from you like a YouTube algorithm. But then the TV, uh, well, the, 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 this, this, this being freaks out and starts pumping this toxic gas into all of the, the, uh, the top floor bedroom uh, bedrooms. And uh, I don't know whether it's a toxic fume, whether it's... At this point, I'm thinking it's probably nanobites of some kind. And, uh, and Yeah, so it does something, because... What the mother in, gets trapped in one of the rooms. The bathroom. She's in the, the bathroom, bathroom. Yep. And, Oh, Nick desperately tries to get her out, but we get a cut inside where we see all of her flesh is starting to dissolve before she just explodes. <laughs> Mom! Mom! Yeah, and it's kind of a weird explosion because it doesn't detonate the windows that they're out. They're out or no, anything. it's just it's they're affecting the organic material inside. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird how she explodes. I thought they'd blow up the windows or something just to be proper horror. Well, I guess all the windows are still sealed. Yeah. So. Well, well, I the guess thing. the window of like the, the doors and everything seems to be locked shut and it seems to be affected. It's a weird. The physics of what's going on are a little bit strange. It's like that's a normal bathroom door. I can kick a lock off a normal bathroom door. So it <laughs> must be like in somehow in reinforcing materials in a way you cannot see, which is never explained. Um, yeah. And again, this film is a little light on explanation, and there is a lot of criticism of that when you come to the close. Um, well, that's pretty much where we are now, yeah. right, right at the close, where the TV has been blinking. At one point, it it repeated the names of the of the of the potential child names, which I think was uh, was it Lewis or, or Ruby. Yes, and uh, and the TV was you know it's made it uh, it's made it to the our characters know that it's been listening it's been watching them mm. and uh, it, again it tells them I, I see you and it also at several points says like not to try and breach outside there was a moment when uh, when Jake tried to open up the access hatch and got his fingers severed uh, which was a pretty you know jump worthy you know gory moment but the TV is now just like basically asking them uh, to to worship it. Uh, it's again. This is where the metaphors are beginning to get a bit heavy because it isn't subtle about what it's kind of trying to. Oh, look, you're all worshiping television, and the older generations seem to be a bit more entwined in it, and the younger generations have a mixed response to it, uh, and everybody gets screwed by it. Um, obviously, there's been multitude of deaths up till now, and then we get to the finale with the father and. Son sort of throw down. Yeah, um, starts wrestling with each other. He ends up, you know, they end up wrestling with the axe. You know, Tony ends up getting knocked down to the ground, and Nick literally drops the television on his head. You know, yes, but <laughs> finishing off his dad and with the television. Yeah, and then uh, turning and embracing his girlfriend and uh, being relieved that the uh, yes. it's all over as they can. It isn't. No, um, it isn't because that's when the film really dials up the weird. As the uh, as the cable monster erupts from the television set, and I applaud the fact that they didn't CGI this. No, no, I mean again, it's again, this is where I'm not knocking the entirety of this film in terms of its production. The the cable monster looks okay. Yeah, and I'm not going to say amazing because it looks like you didn't CGI it because it looks a bit wonky. <laughs> I don't know, I, but I, I it like looks the visual fine. of it. Yeah, I mean that's the it, it's 
it's wonky, but it's fine. And the kind of the lighting in here has all gone very green. And again, that's where I just felt it was just like they just put a lens shade over it. it just well, the fact that feel... there was there's you know there's no external lighting coming into the house because it's completely sealed. So we should be getting this like blue, I guess, television yeah, I feel, glow light. I feel they didn't get the lighting right. I think you could have lit that amazingly. The whole thing should have been like static in certain yeah. moments. And I just, again, I just feel there was a l slight I... lack of creative imagination when it came to making use of the set. Sure. Again, they could have lit it better. They could have shot some of this more tightly. Um, a little bit more drama. To help with the claustrophobia of it. Close-up shots. Like, yeah. you take a shot close up to yeah. his face, you're going to get the sweat, the blood, the tears. Yeah. And you just feel they're breathing I admit, on it, the lens the, almost. The, the, the technical side of the film feels serviceable, but not. it's not brilliant. I think it brings it all down because this sort of film, where it's definitely TV budget sort of stuff needs to be elevated by a certain spark of creativity. And it may be the cinematography, it may be the light, you know, well, that cinematography in no broad sense, because lighting is say it all ties into that, um, is where I think it falters. Script isn't great, and some of the, the end choices, as we said, the, the, the bit right now is where you have a possessed father who's got the cable slamming in the back of his head, and he's <laughs> being the puppeted. Runs, <laughs> and he goes after his son, but then his son runs into, like, the dining room. And, with and Angie. And Angie slam the kind of but the, cabinet down. The, the computer gets to communicate with them, and again, it's just like, worship me. That's all it really wants. It's yeah, supposed to be worshipped. It's the TV wants to be worshipped um and he says no f you yeah and now, that... the, there was also a weird cut that happens in the film where both both angie and nick wake up in a field you know it's our only really outside shot since the beginning yeah, of the film yeah you know it's a bright colorful sunshine afternoon you know and it's just like oh like it was all a dream and then bang, we're straight back into the to the carnage again. I was like, well, I don't really know what that scene. I don't either. And was it, meant to again, serve. It, there's a lot of weirdness here because Nick basically opens the door, swearing and we go, "Kill me! You want me alive? You want but me? You to can't worship kill me, me can't because you need me to worship you." And yeah. then he's like, "No, apparently he does. Just kill him." Yeah, but <laughs> you don't see what happens around you. Well, they both got tied up in the cable, so I'm guessing they both got yeah, cut to the, pieces it, with the hatchet. But no, there's such an unsatisfying ending. Yeah. I mean, in the sense, if you're going to go for purely horror, you, you want the gruesome deaths with the futile ending. And the ending, the you know, at that point, everyone's dead, you assume. You're not yeah. sure, because you never see Angie die. She got buried in cables. Uh, then the dirt father went at his son with a hatchet. But then what we see next is what those cables are capable of, is when they have the daughter there and the cables cover her the and then reveal yeah. her skeleton underneath. Because they said they saw the baby moving inside yes. its dead mother. So it, you realise the baby's still alive and at that point the cables bio-strip the body. Which is just, what I can uh, imagine happened to Angie or, 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 maybe, or Nick yeah, under maybe, those cables but, anyway. And then you see her two hip bones and the baby just sitting yes. there. Which is quite gruesome. Yeah. And the only really gruesome sort of revelation of the film. I mean, honestly, this is a really tame film a lot of the time. The, In terms of gore, yeah. yeah um, but that bit is quite shocking. And the baby, and then, he, and then the TV dragged there by the father zombie. Um... And, and the TV's put down in front of it. And it says a little... <laughs> Worship me. <laughs> no, 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 it says... A, it names the baby. Yes, it does. It knows it's Ruby. The, Ruby. Yeah. Hello, Ruby. Worship me. Um, <laughs> and then you zoom out to the street where all these black cables are wrapping the entire... The entire neighbourhood. neighborhood. So we don't know. I mean, at this point, we can kind of imagine that this is a global event wherever there is electronics or especially yeah. anyone that has... Uh, a, maybe not a widescreen television in their homes because, I mean, this was 2018 and there are no flat screen monitors or TVs in the house. No, and again, um, it's they've all got phone. It's I'm weird. pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it could get into a flat screen TV anyway. Maybe. Yeah, but, yeah, probably. The the film as a whole though is a met playing on metaphors and it doesn't do them very subtly. And the worship of te technology in the news and the you know, the political divides that are formed by these strange events that are played out in such a way through television. Are divisive. Okay, I get all that, but I don't think this film. I, I was I was still it. really satisfied with the ending. Yeah. I uh, I didn't I don't mind like everybody getting killed at the end of the movie. No, like I mean, I granted the, the film's theme <laughs> of, of obeying your television or whatever this entity or creature is. Yeah, that that stuff is on the nose and it's fine. But I, I just liked the. Uh, I guess almost the Lovecraftian apocalyptic nature of liked, this this entity from nowhere. I liked that just in taking principle. over. I liked that in principle, but I felt there was no. I didn't care at the cast. It's like a lot of bad films 
have one major problem is they don't know how to make me empathise with the cast. And I think this did it. I think it had all the components and all the reasons. They were all reasonable factors. I don't think any I don't know. I really liked Angie. So. Yeah. Well, no, Angie was cool. And I don't think the main lead was that bad. Yeah, um, yeah. Again, I'm not knocking any of the actors. I just don't think the script made me I, I, I absolutely agree. I think the film's weakest point or the weakest uh, you know, attribute of the entire film is the script because the dialogue feels forced in order to convey the themes and on-the-nose politics that they wanted to put into the film, which I do feel could have been a little bit more subtle well, yeah. um, and nuanced and built up gradually instead of just hitting us with it so obviously and so and soon. And the problem is the rest of it's quite genially mundane and that's the problem in the sense of this sort of film. I didn't feel that. I thought, no, that, no, I thought no, no, the no, escalation but, of no, the no. events were, were, were really well paced. Maybe, but the justification of half of them didn't work. The character motivations weren't clear and I think the script didn't work with them. I think they didn't utilise the spaces interestingly. As I said, I think cinematography is a huge letdown along with the script, which are two huge pillars of filmmaking. I mean, actors can only carry so much. Um, and I think the actors all did a really yeah, good job I there. I think the actors to some extent are the one part i liked and i think well just what were your favorite scenes from oh, wait, oh forever the baby being the baby sequence was awesome <laughs> because that was as i said the goriest but also most shocking moment um the tv a whole tv lying up i liked it i liked the way it lit some of the scenes but i felt they didn't again utilize it enough and i thought there should have almost been a ah, that's it there should have been a visceral insanity to all of it and i think that's where you use lighting to indicate the psychological state of all your cast and they didn't make it clear enough or maybe they, they were too restrained with the lighting because again I think there was a conventional team a TV show kind of crew on this and I think that hinders it because they're not daring enough when you get proper indie sh movies even the weaker ones you often see sequence you go oh that's pretty inventive I didn't find myself looking at anything in this. Maybe bar the, the dad rising as a zombie at the end. I'm like, okay, that's kind of funky. But as much as I enjoy Borg, um, <laughs> uh, it, it wasn't standout enough. I, th I, I Like I said, it wasn't... A, the sinister nature of that sequence felt a little bit silly. Sure. And that's where I said... I, maybe that's why people call it a black comedy, because it, it was a strange finale the ending is strange i mean if you're gonna go for grim apocalyptia i love grim apocalyptia and if you're gonna sometimes like i said the best outcome for a cthulhu story is a draw um the worst outcome is not a draw um <laughs> at scales of horrible um but in this it's like it's a strange apocalypse because i don't feel there's an emotional connection to that apocalypse at the end it's sure. cool especially when you see the streets and all the cables everywhere but I don't feel empathy for the family that just died desperately, bar maybe the baby that's a little bit lonely, and I'm not sure how long that's going to live. <laughs> um, but it doesn't make sense. No. It, it leaves a lot of uh, questions There's too many unanswered. plot holes as well. That's the big one. Because, I mean, I don't know. They're all big problems. Like I said, this is a mixed thing. What, what did you like, though? I mean, um, I, I, I didn't more. particularly have any favourite scenes, but there are some memorable ones. And I, I, like I said, I really liked the, uh, the, the dinner table sequence. Uh, just the family dynamic when he's saying yeah. grace. I was like, that's a it's good well character made. moment where they're all on screen together and we really get to see how, how they work with each other. You know, the, the mother exploding in the bathroom. That was great. <laughs> the fingers in the access port. That, that was fun. Um, and I guess the uh, just the, the television's messages, basically telling them to obey. Um, and I guess I also like the uh, washing themselves in bleach. You're okay in there, Doug. I can still scrub me on balls. I'll be down the hall if you need me. <laughs> yes, that was strange. Um, again, more strange things and more strange things. <laughs> I mean... Well, Jess, do you recommend Await Further Instructions? Not really. It's a 1984 sort of electronic monster Borg um, TV metaphor hodgepodge um, that doesn't really work. It just doesn't. It just doesn't come together correctly. And that's not to say it's terrible, but it just doesn't mix the ingredients correctly. Um, the actors are fine. Um, the script's weak. Some of the cinematography, well, the lack of uh, intriguing cinematography hampers it because I think visuals could have carried this a little bit. 
Um, I don't know who I'd recommend this to. I mean, it's not properly horrific to please any of the uh, people who are after a bit more of a grisly horror film. And it's not really a jump scare. It's not really the, the, little, the little bits of horror dribbling out of it now and then. But otherwise, it's trying to be think a thinky horror film. And it isn't. Because it's not subtle or clever enough to be that. If you're bored, um, you could watch it. <laughs> That's probably my recommendation. It's not worth going out of your way to see. Sure, it? sure. What, what do you think, though? Maybe you're more I, loving. I, I do have to recommend Await Further Instructions, as I tend to really enjoy these concept movies and stories about people trapped in a confined space. The film, for me, had a Twilight Zone vibe, or, or more recently, Black Mirror, you know, dealing with the manipulative effects of technology, uh, wherein the human element uh, that, uh, that reveals itself to be the most monstrous. Uh, I thought the actors all did a good job with the parts, and that David Bradley really excels in playing highly unlikable characters. <laughs> the script definitely could have used a lot of work. Uh, the themes were very much on the nose and the characters very one-dimensional and stereotypical, but that didn't, for me, detract from the growing tension and the well-paced horror that ensued. I guess it's the ending of the film that really decides if you're going to love or hate this story, and I really didn't mind it. For sure it opens up that whole world of questions which you won't get answers, uh, and, and for me that was, that was fine. It, like I said, it almost felt very Lovecraftian. Uh, if not for the film's intended message of worshipping the media and the television and of blindly following an unknown authority figure. I agree, the film was at times very, very lacking. Uh, but the concept and the escalating of the, the mystery kept, kept me rooted to the very end. I was entertained by this low-budget sci-fi horror mystery film, and so for that, I would have to give it uh, a, a mediocre recommendation. I, will, I would say it's, it's worth a watch. Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. Bye-bye now. Okay, no doubt. I can still scrub my own balls. <laughs> <laughs>